When I think about how many minutes of how many days, how many people are spending right now worshiping their worries, it's like travesty. I really thought that I would be happy when I got on Broadway. And then I got on Broadway and three weeks later, it was the saddest I had ever been. And then I found meditation. Stress makes you stupid, sick, and slow. And none of us can afford to be stupid, sick, or slow right now. It's almost impossible to discern the purity of what your soul feels around sexuality because we're so steeped in deliberate conditioning around it. It's been systematic in almost every culture since the beginning of time of divorcing people from their own divinity. As we learn to listen to our bodies, as we learn to listen to our own desires and stop cutting ourselves off, but actually start to honor the whole thing as holy, the whole thing as divine, then it is true that we start listening to the planet as well. Hello, beautiful humans. Welcome back to the Know Thyself podcast where every single week I get the honor, I get the privilege, we get to go on this journey together to know ourselves and the world around us at deeper and deeper levels today. My guest today is very exciting for me because we've been deepening our friendship over the past couple of weeks and it's really a joy to see what she, uh, the energy and the presence that she brings and infuses the world with. She's a leading expert uh, in meditation for high performers. She is an author of a best-selling book called Stress Less, Accomplish More. She founded Ziva Meditation and the creator of the Ziva Technique. And she's taught over 50,000 people how to meditate, which is a very beautiful accomplishment. One of the highest that I could honestly say. And she is a host of the new upcoming podcast, which should be out now called Why Isn't Everyone Doing This? And I'm so blessed to be able to support her on that path and journey. I'm really looking forward to all the magic that is to come with that. This episode today is going to be filled with so many uh, insightful nuggets, hopefully for you all in terms of meditation, manifestation, how to use sex magic to create the life of your dreams from the inside out. And my guest today, Emily Fletcher, is somebody on a personal that I've been able to really enjoy her presence. There's that saying that those who know, knows who know. Joy knows joy. Stillness knows stillness. And I get to witness Emily walk into any room and instantly raise the vibration inherently with her presence alone. And it's been really beautiful to see that I can feel the embodiment of her, that she walks the walk. And what she preaches, she practices because she always has a smile on her face and she's constantly filled with joy. So <laughs> Emily, thank you for coming on the show. My honor to have you here today. Oh, I'm already crying. <laughs> That's my most favorite reflection. It's my most favorite mirror is that to be the walking embodiment of that which you are teaching. Because it's easy to tell other people what to do. You know, it's easy to be like, hey, y'all should meditate. Yeah. Hey, you should, you know, transmute your suffering into joy. But to have that reflected back feels really, um, really beautiful. Mm. Thank you. Yeah, of course. And it's such an honor to have you here today. And the, the first podcast that we're doing in this new studio, Woo! this new set, it's so exciting. <laughs> Leg kick. Um, we just did a beautiful invocation and a blessing. Yeah. We christened a new beautiful sound bowl. Yeah, you sang into the sound bowl and like really christened in the space. I just moved into a new spot with more nature and a bigger studio. It's, and it's beautiful. Coming together. Yeah. And I wouldn't rather do this with anyone else. So I'm really stoked to have you here. Um, Wow. Yeah. And it's also raining and it feels like it's just an auspicious day to like really dive deep into a lot of these topics that yeah. both of our souls feel a very strong calling to explore, to dive, to know ourselves deeper. And so there's a lot of overlap here within this conversation. Speaking to like the reflection that I gave you, I really do feel that level of embodiment and presence with you because you can tell when somebody has intellectual knowledge versus somebody that's actually embodied in the practices of meditation and various different movement practices or whatever it may be that allows their nervous system to regulate, that allows them to actually be in the gnosis and the knowing of it, not just the intellectual mind. I've heard you say, and in your book also, that you know most people are unfortunately living in a reality where they're walking around as bags of needs looking for fulfillment <laughs> and to flip it on its head and to actually be a bag of fulfillment looking for needs in the world. And mm -hmm. I think that's such a beautiful flip of the script and something that I think we both feel very called to. And so for you, how do you support individuals and how has it been on your journey becoming a bag of fulfillment? <laughs> I'm sure we can come up with a sexier term for that. <laughs> Maybe not a bag. 
<laughs> I sort of like the irreverence of it. Sure. You know, it's like, a, do you want to be a bag of yeah. need? Do you want to be a bag of fulfillment? Like, you get to choose. Yeah. So the other day, we're just like, you know, sacks of bones and blood. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just vessels for this unnameable cosmic intelligence. Um, but how have I helped people to transition? Yeah, and also more so on your own journey, you know, like becoming in that paradigm switch of becoming fulfilled in in and of itself because most people are under the illusion that it's you know one day when they'll become happy and stress free and peaceful when they attain the job the career the relationship whatever it is and i think it's powerful and you teach a lot about manifestation and to utilize your desire to become a creator to manifest in your life but there's also this balance of becoming embodied in not being attached and being completely fulfilled with where you are and your where your feet are in this moment and so if you want to speak to a little bit about your journey coming to that place within yourself. Yeah. I mean, that's the great paradox of manifestation is that it is enthusiastic gratitude for, for what is right now is actually the fastest path to enthusiastic gratitude for what is on the way. And so if we can't get to a place of real acceptance and real gratitude for what is, it's not fertile soil to plant the seeds of the desires for what you would love to be on the way. And, and it, it really requires this paradox of laser sharp specific placing the order with the cosmic server at the cosmic restaurant and total and complete detachment from outcome because the second that you get into like you mentioned what I call the I'll be happy when syndrome I'll be happy when I have a partner I'll be happy when I have a million dollars I'll be happy when I have a kid I'll be happy when this kid gets the f out of my house I'll be happy when I'm divorced I'll be happy you know we just keep moving the finish line and so the thing is our bliss is always only ever found in the right here inside of us and in the right now and so on my own personal journey I've always been very ambitious. I've always been very driven. And I really thought that I would be happy when I got on Broadway. Like I told myself that story till I was eight. And then I got on Broadway and three weeks later, it was the saddest I had ever been. And I just thought next show, next boyfriend, next year in the bank account, next agent. And I did that for a decade. And then I started like going gray, getting sick, getting injured, like sucking at my job. So even though I'm living the dream on Broadway, doing the thing I'd wanted to do since I was a child, I was miserable. And then I found meditation. Like I actually took a class, like my, the woman sitting next to me in the dressing room was amazing. She was like nailing every, every role she played. She was so good at it. And so I went to her teacher and on the first day of the first class, I was in a different state of consciousness that I had ever been in. I liked it. I slept through the night that night for the first time in 18 months. I then did not get sick for eight and a half years. I stopped going gray. I started enjoying my job again. And I was like, why isn't everyone doing this? <laughs> and that's not just a story that I tell to promote my upcoming podcast called, why isn't everyone doing this? It's legitimate. I, I am that person. When I find something good, I want to shout it from the rooftops. And so it was, at first, it was meditation that allowed me to plug myself into myself, right? It, it gave me this visceral way to plug into pure being. It gave me the visceral access to this thing that we've always known to be true. Every spiritual text has been teaching it since the beginning of time. What you seek is in you. We know that. The kingdom of heaven is within. We don't need any more spiritual texts to tell us that. Yeah. What we need are visceral practices to help us find that. And so that's what meditation gave me. And it did transition me from being like, will you hire me? Will you date me? Will you like me? And I would even be on stage performing, being like, please love me, please love me. And like, let me just get bigger and bigger audiences to validate my need to be fulfilled externally, which is repulsive. You know what I mean? Like watching yeah. that on stage is repulsive because yeah. audiences can feel it. They're, they're paying you, you know, they don't want to work, right? They actually want to receive. They want to, they want to be the recipient of your plug, your ability to plug into the divine. That's what great art is, right? It's, it's an individual expression of divinity flowing through you. It's what great singers, great writers, great performers are. And so when I finally found meditation, it allowed me to start to be a vessel and start to be a vehicle for fulfillment to be delivered through me. And that revolutionized everything. My performance, my relationships, my relationship with my body, my sleep, my health, all of it. And now there's been many iterations of that. And I had to learn how to give from a place of my own desire, like 
learning to discern when is it my desire to give and when am I giving out of a place of obligation or codependence or people pleasing. And so it's been, you know, like there's always a new layer. There's always a new level of healing or a new way to know yourself. But it's been a fun, fun ride. Yeah. And you spoke to you, like you, as you deepen that like self-gnosis and finding that fulfillment in your own self, you then become a magnet. Whereas the other, the other way is like being repulsive, you know, where that's that energy where you're actually pushing away what you're grasping onto. But th- from that place, you actually invite what's meant for you when you find a stillness and peace into your own being and recognize that within yourself. Yeah, because it's like when you trust yourself, you can actually like like loosen the death grip on the desire. Because if every day, twice a day, you're flooding your brain with dopamine and serotonin, which are bliss chemicals, then it's no longer an intellectual concept. It actually is a physical biochemical change that happens in your body that your body now trusts that it can access unlimited fulfillment internally whenever you need. And paradoxically, that is the thing that creates the detachment from the desire. It's impossible to be in the I'll be happy when syndrome when you are infinitely happy right now. And that is what meditation does for you. It it just changes, it moves you from fight or flight into stay and play. Everybody knows that. But it actually, like, I think no one's talking as much about how meditation can soften the death grip on those desires. And I tell this manifesting story about my son, He's almost five now, but when he was about two, I wouldn't really give him sugar. I was like pretty draconian about sugar. And so the sweetest thing he had ever eaten was blueberries. And so he was like obsessed with blueberries. And anytime he would see them, he'd be like, blueberries, blueberries, (laughs) blueberries. And one time I was pulling them out. He he asked for some, so I was pulling them out of the refrigerator. And I was trying to put them in his hand, but he wanted them so bad that he was clenching his fist. And he was like, blueberries, (laughs) blueberries. And he was like crying and he was so pissed that the blueberries were not already inside of his mouth (laughs) that he wouldn't open up his hand so that I could give him the blueberries. And so I was like, oh, I think this is such a parable because most of us are like a million dollars, a boyfriend, a house in Malibu. And it's like, but we aren't, we aren't trusting ourselves or trusting that nature actually gave us the desire, that our desires are in fact divinely inspired. We aren't trusting that. We think we have to prove or achieve or work harder, uh, or we think that we'll be happy once the thing shows up, which disallows us from being happy now. And then it creates more suffering, which creates more distance between the thing and the thing that you're looking to magnetize. So powerful because you get a reflection in life of who you actually are, not just what you want, right? And so that switch from actually finding and reconciling that energy within you, then you become that open hand that becomes available for the universe, the cosmic waitress to actually deliver the meal or deliver whatever it is that your desire wants to. And finding that sweet spot, that middle way of, yes, we can't get around having desire and wanting to create things as part of using our life force energy to bring things from the unmanifest to the manifest. And when you align your desire with nature's desire and like the intelligence of nature and the universe, then things happen much faster and you actually get what you want and you want what you get. And like that middle point is really juicy and is really exciting. I love that. Get what you want, want what you get. That's like enthusiastic gratitude for what is. And I love these that also of like aligning your desires with nature's desires. And that's, that's what I teach at Ziva. Like the manifesting that I teach at Ziva, we do it right after the meditation. Right, so you drop into these very powerful altered state of consciousness where your your right and left brains are functioning in unison. You're getting rest that's five times deeper than sleep, and you're basically de-exciting the nervous system. So it's like that wave of individuality gets to drop down into the ocean of totality. It gets to remember that there is only one thing, and we're all it. So then, from that place, from that everythingness. We end the meditation. We start to come back into the left brain waking state individuality, but from that liminal in between space, then we ask the question, what would I love? What would I love right now? And when you do it from that powerful, potent place of not quite waking, not quite dreaming, you know, really have that neuroplasticity firing, my my theory, which has been proven to be true, is that it's easier for nature to communicate, like how she wants to use you. It's easier for you to hear what the actual inspired desires are, which is a different from an addictive longing. Yep. And I, and God bless anyone who's trying to manifest who does not have a daily meditation practice or some way to tap into God. Like it might be painting for six hours or surfing or, and please do not 
I am not saying that painting is meditation. I am certainly not saying that surfing is meditation because they aren't. And I really, like if I could get on a soapbox for a minute, like please, can we all just stop saying that washing dishes is meditation because it's fucking not. (laughs) It's called washing dishes. I get that you can access a meditative state when you're washing dishes. You can access a meditative state when you're walking in the woods. Awesome not meditation. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Like meditation is where you're accessing a verifiable fourth state of consciousness. And then that state can start to permeate the other 23 hours of the day. Um, But when you manifest from that place, it's so much easier because if you don't have a means by which to remind yourself that you, that fulfillment only exists inside of you, then almost all of your longings are addictive. More money, more jobs, more followers, more sex, more candy, more alcohol, more booze, more pills, right? We and then and then we're looking to fill an internal void with external substances, and that is never effective. And we live in a society where, unless you have that conscious choice to actually make that a reality for yourself, the modern society in which we live is going to make that very hard for you to actually embody. There's so much noise, constant waves of new information coming into our. Um, into our consciousness every single day, that stimuli we're not built for. It's very new to us in the past couple hundred years. And so a line from the Vedas that you said is one of your favorite is that truth waits for eyes unclouded by longing. And that's exactly what you're speaking to, right? Unclouded by longing, where you can actually just be present and then truth can become revealed to you because truth always is. It's always here. Truth is always truth. And you just have to remove the parts of you that are blocking you from it. Mm hmm. Yeah. Thank you for that quote. The truth waits for eyes unclouded by longing. And the beautiful byproduct of that is that if you're, if you're meditating every day, then you're actually wiping away the longing from your lens of perception because you're flooding your brain and body with that bliss chemistry. So it, it can't help but make you less attached to any sort of outcome. Um, and so I like to say that it makes you less likely to make a mistake, right? Mm. Because like, what's a mistake? It's a mistake. You took something to be one thing when it was actually something else. It's like you wanted this thing to be the partner, the job, the deal. Um, and and like you wanted it to be ABC. It looked like ABC. It dressed like A, B, and C. It told you it was A, B, and C, but actually it was D, E, and F. And so if we want something to be something bad enough, it's very easy to put on blinders to what is. And so if you're meditating every day, twice a day, you're accessing the very source of fulfillment, which wipes away that longing from the lens of perception, which in turn allows you to see things for what they actually are, which makes you less likely to make a mistake. So if that's all meditation did for you, it would actually be saving you time. Hmm. Because think about how much time you waste cleaning up your mistakes. Now, it doesn't mean you never make a mistake again. It just makes you less likely to make one. Like you still have your learning and your life syllabus, but who wants to waste time cleaning up avoidable mistakes? (laughs) Not me. (laughs) Me neither. (laughs) So there is a beautiful, I guess, distinction I'd love for you to provide in terms of, because you've helped so many people, high performer CEOs, learn meditation, and kind of as it with the Trojan horse of like, listen, you'll have better sex, you'll make more money, all that is great. (laughs) And they're getting the real good. So who cares, right? And- For somebody that wants to just, I guess, optimize their reality or kind of have that level of self-improvement, that's one thing. How do you share meditation in a way differently for somebody who wants to know the true nature of their existence? (laughs) This is such a fascinating question at a fascinating time because I feel like the whole zeitgeist planet frequency of the earth, if you will, is shifting from this sort of hyper-driven, hyper-achievement focused, hyper-accomplishment focused, more masculine paradigm into a more feminine paradigm. And that does not mean that the future is female. It means that the future is more feminine, more magnetizing, more receptive, more balanced, balanced, more integrated. Yeah. And, and so I very much built my whole business and career on like wrapping this powerful medicine of meditation in the candy coating of more money, better sex. And and I feel proud of that, honestly. Like it is one of my gifts is to translate esoteric concepts to a mainstream audience in a way that is both attractive and accessible. And I would do it again if I was in that time on the planet again. We're not in that time anymore, right? That not only is the frequency of the planet changing, but the whole freaking world just went through a near-death experience. And nothing will wake, well, it'll either... <laughs> wake people up or make them a lot more stressed when you go through a near-death experience. And we're seeing that bifurcation happen now. 
people who have had, have had access to therapy and medicine work and shadow work and meditation, like they're, they're ushering themselves and popping off into very high states of consciousness very quickly. I mean, we're seeing it in our community. Like people are like, turn into sex witches, like popcorn. <laughs> and then on the flip side, people who have not had access to those um, tools and healing modalities, we're seeing like really rapid spiraling into depression, anxiety, suicide. And so one of the missions now is like, how do we equip? It's like, a, just like we've had a K-shaped economic recovery post COVID, there's been this K-shaped spiritual recovery. And so now it feels like one of the challenges for, you know, all of us to solve really is how do we equip the people who are evolving really quickly to be able to help the people who are not, not because it's one is better than the other, but just like to live in a bifurcated society isn't, isn't fun. Yeah. It's not nice when we can't find unity points with other people. Um, so now the medicine is different. Like the, the, the potency of the medicine that people are willing to take right now is very different than it was when I started in 2009. And so now I just, I have the luxury of not having to wrap things in candy coating anymore. And I can just offer the medicine. Mm -hmm. And that's been really liberating and really exciting because I, I mean, look, if I'm going to give a talk at Google, it's probably going to be different than if I'm giving a talk in like Topanga Canyon yeah. to a bunch of my hippie friends, yeah. you know, <laughs> like, like I still know my audience, sure. um, but it's always for me, but like meet people where they are, get them started on the foundational practice of meditation. Because without that, without you plugging yourself into the divine every day, it's very hard to install high level software. Like you can't install like the newest Mac operating system on a PC from 1995. It's just a waste of time and it actually stresses out the nervous system. So step one for me always is defrag the hard drive, defrag the brain computer. And then from there we can install really high level software. And so I have um, a beautiful course called Moving Into Mastery, which is basically a year long curriculum, which has been a, a fun outlet for me to translate my 16 years of studying the Vedas into these different applicable areas of the life, like mastering your brain, your body, your money, your relationships, your creativity, your performance. And so that's been one way. And then recently I've started something called Evidence of Magic. And look, 10 years ago, no way would I have put something on my website that had any word on it called magic. I, <laughs> I would not have made a video called Evidence of Magic. And this thing, I created it in November. It sold out in two weeks. We thought we were gonna have to sell it in January. And people were like, and people were like mad at me. They were writing me, be like, your EA told me she was gonna save me a spot and she didn't. <laughs> and like they were like like tripping over themselves yeah. to get into this thing called yeah. evidence of magic. And I was like, whoa, <laughs> world is changing. Yeah. World is changing. And so the premise of this is basically like, can we use the most powerful force that we have, which is our creation energy, our sexual energy, to create a world and a life that we would really want. So we basically like play games around it. And like each month there's like manifesting games. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so point of the story is like everyone still comes through the same, like learn to meditate. Like everybody's got to get the foundation yeah. because then on that beautiful brain hard drive foundation, we can go into profound, deep, spiritual, philosophical places. And that journey to see what becomes available to you, like using your sexual energy to amplify your manifestation capabilities and things that we'll be diving down to a little bit later down the road in this podcast is incredible. On the theme of meditation, at what point have you found that people switch from meditation just being something they do once or twice a day to it being something that they are? Like having that quality of meditativeness carried throughout your day, it doesn't mean that you don't do meditation where you have a practice of 10, 20, 30, an hour a day or whatever it is. But that point, you know, after a sustained, consistent, aligned action over a period of time, mm -hmm. that frequency starts to be a reality that you start to embody more. Mm -hmm. And that's when a lot of these things we're talking to you about actually receiving what the universe wants for you and magnetizing, you know, the relationships that you truly want, that nature wants for you, that becomes available as you start to develop that, that presence of meditativeness. Yeah, I'd say it's different for everybody because a lot of people have been running the software for a long time or at least like immersing themselves in the software. They've been reading the books. They've been, you know, ingesting all the lectures and listening to the podcast. So they get it intellectually. Yeah. And then the moment that they can like actually physically, viscerally drop into the unmanifest, it's like, it's like all that backlog of software gets installed. And then they have this big surge in consciousness and they're like, whoa, I am like, they feel like superheroes, right? And then some people 
have never thought about any of this stuff, never thought about manifesting that I'll written it off as hooey. And they're just super driven, super, um, you know, evidence based on the 3D. And then, and then as they start to bit by a bit, start to dance in these other states of consciousness, even without psychedelics, even without hours of breath work, they are changing their consciousness every day, twice a day. So, so you're no longer under the illusion that this is all there is. And so then it's a bit more gradual for most people, but they, I mean, they've had many studies that prove that your brain indelibly changes after eight weeks. And that's just of mindfulness, just mindfulness. And, and I'm saying just there on purpose because I'm a meditation snob. And um, you don't say. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm so snobby about meditation. Um, <laughs> I also like to call myself the most competitive meditation teacher, <laughs> which I recognize what an asshole that makes me, but I am doubling down on it. <laughs> just kidding, just kidding. Um, no, I so mindfulness, just to you know, yeah. get those out of the way. So Ziva is mindfulness, meditation, and manifesting. So like three M's, that's what I teach. And the difference between mindfulness and meditation is that mindfulness I would define as the, the art of bringing your awareness into the present moment here and now. And you can do that while you're washing dishes or walking in the woods. Full presence. You're not on your phone. You're actively bringing your awareness to the, the sensation of your foot hitting the floor of the forest. You're actively feeling the temperature of the water on your hands as you wash dishes. Intense presence, beautiful mindfulness. Left brain is online. We're actively focusing on something. A guided visualization breath work, visualizing your chakras, putting your energy on different um, energetic meridians, beautiful, powerful. And I would put those in the mindfulness category, which is different than meditation, or at least the meditation that I teach at Ziva, which is based on something called Nishkam Karma Yoga, union attained by action, hardly taken, lazy man's meditation, lazy person's meditation, excuse me. <laughs> um, and so in it, like I said, you're getting rest that's five times deeper than sleep. So you're sort of dropping into these unmanifest states. It looks kind of like this, right? Which, which does not make for a great Instagram selfie, <laughs> <laughs> but it feels amazing. And then from that space, you are more recharged, more awake. Um, you have yeah, you're more awake and therefore more conscious on the other side. And so if you're doing that every day, twice a day, like the rate with which it permeates into the rest of your life is going to be pretty fast. Um, but anyway, I'm just saying there's studies that say that mindfulness can change the brain within eight weeks. I think that how long the full integration takes is dependent on each person, their trauma, their dedication. Mm. Are they eating Twinkies for dinner right. or not? <laughs> <laughs> It's great. And those distinctions, I think, are really powerful for those that are trying to live in an activated, awakened existence. For me, I've always tried to project out into my future what I'm going to be like in 10, 5, 10, 20, 30, 40 years. And to like feel what the opportunity cost of not meditating and not doing these practices actually is. Because we all know lots of 70, 80, 90-year-olds that have become calloused and very decrepit. And there's some 70, 80, 90 year olds that have joy and that childlike energy still alive within them. Yeah. And we get to choose which path we want to go down by the actions we, we you know, take every single day. Yeah. And so you do an amazing job. And that's why you've been so impactful in the space of making meditation, kind of wrapping that soul food with the eye candy of, you know, all these other benefits that you're going to get, which is great. And I know for myself, like the, my practices of meditation and um, various different things over the years have been because I've had earlier on more of like the seeking energy, this desire, this longing to know who I am beyond um, any thought or emotion. And so that journey of discovering who we are beneath all of that is something that I'm very passionate about, something that you're very passionate about. Is there anything else you want to say on the opportunity cost of not making this a part of your day? Yeah. In life. There's a lot I want to say about Please it. do, because we're on a podcast, Emily. Thanks for asking. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, the short answer is that if you're not meditating, then you're just going to be stressed. And stress makes you stupid, sick, and slow. <laughs> like, sorry, but it does. Yep. And none of us can afford to be stupid, sick, or slow right now. Like, like the world is literally on fire. Yeah. We do not have time to be stupid, sick, and slow. We need all hands on deck and we need all hands on deck.
There's a reason why you can't find your keys when you're rushing to get out of the door. There's a reason why you can't find your glasses when you're panicked about where your glasses are when they're sitting right on top of your head because stress makes you stupid, sick, and slow. It takes so much cognitive and physical energy to prepare for a predatory attack, which is what your body goes into when you are stressing unnecessarily. And I've basically dedicated my entire life to eradicating unnecessary suffering. Same. <laughs> Yeah, like I get that yeah. suffering is part of the human experience. Like people are going to die and people like your dog is going to be sick. And like I get that suffering is part of the human experience. And that I am great with. And I'm becoming increasingly more great with my own suffering. Like meaning that I am loving it and accepting it and leaning into it. But unnecessary suffering is just dumb. It's just dumb. Like stress is a solvable problem. <laughs> and people aren't meditating. This shit has been around for 6,000 years. <laughs> And like the sleeping pills and the wine and the coffee is not cutting it. Like how many more decades of research do you need to do before you actually give yourself permission to feel good? Before you actually spend the precious time that we have that, that is available to us to, to resource yourself versus deplete yourself. Because what I see happening now is like, oh, well, I have one hour between, you know, work and going to bed. Or I'm working two jobs and I have kids and, and I'm not, I don't want to diminish like the real challenges that people are going through and it's even more important you're a single mom you have two jobs and you have kids it's even more important that any minutes in the day that you have to yourself that you're actually replenishing and resourcing yourself and not watching the news not drinking wine not eating a sl sleeve of oreos and no judgment on any of that stuff but it's just like anything that's depleting you versus filling you up like this is what we want to become increasingly discerning about. And then the good news is that, and, and the, to laugh doesn't cost anything. You know, joy, laughter, this is free. Meditation, like, you know, I charge for my Ziva course, but there are, but we give scholarships and there are zillions of YouTube channels, which we can talk about later. Those are guided visualizations, not really meditation, but right. we can have that chat later. But there are many, many ways to de-stress ourselves and to really putting your feet on the soil free sex free sometimes <laughs> <laughs> um, so it's just just really i would invite people to get so discerning about what truly nourishes you versus what is depleting and and well interestingly for me like i had a troubled relationship with social media and and instagram like i would say if i had an addiction it was social media yeah. and and my coach actually helped me to reframe it and she was like well emily like is that your entertainment and i was like oh i was like i don't have a tv i don't watch tv i don't watch the news i haven't gone to a movie since i was pregnant like, so I was like, yeah. So like, and I actually, so, so I'm on Instagram for 10 or 15 minutes a day. And like, that's sort of my entertainment. Mm -hmm. And I, and actually now I don't judge it and I still do it, yeah. but now I'm not judging it as bad or an addiction, which has changed my relationships. And it actually feels nourishing versus depleting. So interesting frame shift, even though I didn't change the behavior. Our relationship to any phenomena outside of us, like that's the most important to cultivate. It stems from the place in which we're interacting, right? The the consciousness that we're holding within ourselves. We hold, we judge so much of what we do and then we continue to attract it at that level of consciousness until we start to transcend that way of being. And so is there anything you want to speak to as we're moving into some of the more quote unquote taboo topics that we're going to be Ooh. diving into? Transcending the level of shame and conditioning that we've accumulated either through family, through society, in regards to sexual energy, in regards to uh, being able to move in the direction that you just genuinely want to move into and being okay being that black sheep in the family, you know, whatever it is. <laughs> So we, there's a lot of things that people will judge us for that we, that we take on as self-shame, right? Making money making money, going to so many different things, right? And that reclamation of what you want, not what other people want, is a process. To like shed those voices that aren't yours, like it's a, it's a process. It takes time to mm. actually remove and get clear. Like we were sp speaking to earlier, to be able to develop and have those innocent cognitions and have those moments where you're actually listening and you're getting clarity on reality. So you talked about kind of getting rid of the, the the software and upgrading the hard drive first, right? So, and then go go into a little bit about, um, yeah, releasing and letting go a lot of that shame and conditioning that we've accumulated. <laughs> 
so it's almost impossible to discern like what your true like what you, the purity of what your soul feels around things like sexuality because we're so steeped in very very purposeful deliberate and relentless conditioning around it and it's not uh, an accident it's not a mistake it's been systematic in almost every culture since the beginning of time of in in different ways divorcing people from their own divinity that you need to go through the church and maybe not even just through the church, but also through the Pope to get to God. And you need to tithe and you need to pay your church 10% of your earnings to be right with God. And you need to get baptized or um, christened or circumcised or like whatever the rituals are that we put into place that are like these barriers to this purity to get to God. And you know, I am I am no one's historian on this, but you can see the ways that that political organizations and religious organizations have worked together in almost every country since the beginning of time. And and my theory here is that people who really have the ability to plug themselves directly into the divine, who know themselves to actually be the frequency of creation itself, of love itself, of, dare I say, God itself. Um, and by the way, when I say the word God, I would define that as the collective consciousness of all that is. The collective consciousness of all that is. It's not a white dude with a beard in the sky judging you when you masturbate. Okay. <laughs> it's the collective consciousness of all that is. Like, you know, I grew up with white Jesus. Like, I was raised Southern Baptist. And so I had like a white, sweaty dude in a khaki suit yelling at me, telling me what I was supposed to do with my body since I was born, really. And, and even at five years old, I was like, that's not it for me. Yeah. That's not it. And I remember at five, I went to my mom and I was like, how do we know we're Baptist? She was like, excuse me, five-year-old child. And I was like, <laughs> how do we know we're Baptist? Like, was, were, were we born Baptist or like, did we choose it? <laughs> and she's like, what do you mean? And I was like, well, your best friend is Buddhist, right? And my mom's best friend was Japanese and she was Buddhist. And my mom was like, yeah. And I was like, so that guy, the sweaty dude in the khaki sh sh suit, told me that she's going to burn and rot in hell? What? Why are you friends with her? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, how could you be friends with someone who's going to burn and rot in hell when you're like hanging out with angels in heaven? Like, I <laughs> did not compute. And again, I'm five. And much to my mom's credit, she let me go and like check out the synagogue and the Church of Latter-day Saints. I mean, there wasn't like a great selection in Tallahassee, right. Florida, but I got to like <laughs> at least try on like different flavors of Christianity. Sure. And, and what I realized, again... Was it or my the working model that I came up with is that God is a disco ball, and that we're all looking at the same thing, and you're seeing purple and you're seeing green and I'm seeing red, but we're all looking at this same thing, and and when we feel separate from that, or when we feel like we have to go through someone to get to that, we're a lot easier to control. But when we start to access that inside of ourselves, we do trust our own soul. We do trust our own desires and we will serve that almost above anything else. And so part of my passion in diving into sacred sexuality is because I've seen firsthand again and again, this democratization of God where people are like, oh, I am powerful. Oh, I am creative. Like, oh, I do trust my desires because if you don't know what you want sexually, it's actually really hard to know what you want in your life. And that good news, as you start to experiment with and listen to what your body is asking for sexually, it becomes a lot easier to be like, oh, this is what I want in my life. So as far as the shame, I, I mean, I, I heard you on like, it takes a long time. And I think that it can take a long time because certainly we've had decades and decades and sometimes lifetimes right. of programming, but I've actually seen it fall away really quickly. You know, like Layla Martin, my best friend and world class, outrageous Tantra teacher, Every time before she ever facilitates any sort of pleasure practice, she always does some sort of a reclamation. So the first time I ever did um, what I call pleasure prayer, which she would call sex magic with her, it was in, it was mixed gender. It was just seven of us who we were on vacation. And before we went into the practice, all of us individually 
we're like pleasuring ourselves, which I imagine hearing that, if this was me three years ago, I would be like sweating right now listening <laughs> to that. Um, but it was it was brave and it was edgy. But while we were doing it, all the, the other six people in the room with deep reverence were yesing. Like, yes, yes. Yes, Andre, yes. Like that is for you. Yes, yes, beautiful. Yes, yes. And so in in minutes, that person got to reclaim their pleasure and all the stories that masturbation is defilement, that it's a sin, that it is shameful, that it's dirty, that you're going to go to hell. I had a, my neighbor told me, he was raised Orthodox Jewish. He said that when he would go to temple, that his rabbi would say, they would pull like a group of like preteen boys and they said, when you die, God's going to play a VHS tape. <laughs> oh my God. There's like a base, like a video camera, like a camcorder running. And, and they're gonna, you're going to have to play a VHS tape of every single thing you've ever done in front of everyone you know. Basically just shaming them out of pleasuring themselves. Yeah. How much fear can we install into this person? And like, what? Like, I don't, I'm trying to even understand why anyone gives a flying fuck if someone else pleasures themselves. <laughs> like, really? Who is it hurting? What is it, de what is it destroying? The answer is nothing. The answer is that you are making love. You are increasing the frequency and the vibration and the biochemistry of love within your own body. And it doesn't hurt anyone. Hmm. It doesn't hurt anyone. And it actually, if done consciously and if directed towards your dreams, and we could talk about like, you know, porn and vibrators and BDSM, that's like a whole nother conversation. But if it's really just about you cultivating and curating your own creation energy, like that's not hurting anyone. It's just charging up your own life force. And then you get to spend that life force where you want, yeah. on your job, on your home. Like it's just, it's just energy. That change in perception is so beautiful, so needed, so helpful for people actually moving the needle in terms of their experience of life from putting sexual energy in this basket of all the conditioning they've accumulated to actually just see how... It is one and the same with life force energy. It's what makes you alive. It's why you're here. It's why all of us are here. And so I would love for you just to dive into a little bit more how they actually are one and the same, how our life force energy, sexual energy is creation energy. Yeah. So you probably, to make this really tangible, uh, if anyone's ever been through a breakup, right? And you, you have all this energy, right? You're not like having sex with that person anymore. So you have this sort of buildup of sexual energy, plus you've got the energy of the heartbreak, which even though that sadness or that mourning or that rage, it can be destructive, it's still energy. And so oftentimes what people will get really, well, they either start drinking a lot, right? So that's destruction destroying itself, <laughs> or you start to channel that into creativity. Adele. Taylor Swift, right? Millions of dollars, multiple Grammy Awards won on the heels of a breakup. Poetry starts pouring out of us. Films, like how many creative projects have been born, paintings have been born out of breakups, yeah. right? So if we start to see that sexual energy and cre creative energy are very similar, right? And that's what I'm calling it, like creation energy. And it can create a human or it could create a painting or it could create a million dollars, but that it is, it's like the generator, that our hoo-ha, and I use this word hoo-ha because I can say it on a TED Talk stage, which is easier than cock or pussy. Because um, <laughs> those words are really charged up too. You know, like pussy, this beautiful divine matrix point for the entire species we've now co-opted to be the worst insult you could call a human being. Mm. Right, so let's all just also examine the deep misogyny in our human language and know like that that has conditioned us as well. Yeah. Like how many people who identify as female don't even want to look at their own bodies because they've been conditioned to think that that's an insult. So when you start to see that sexual energy is simply creative energy and that yes, it, it can it can create a baby, like you could create life with it, which is arguably the most divine thing that a human being can do, the most godlike thing that a human can do is create life. And yet every time we orgasm, we don't make a baby. Thank goodness. Again, it'd be real crowded here. We got plenty of people already. Um, and yet what happens with all that energy? And what if we started to take that, those orgasmic states where the veil is very thin? And if you, when you ask most people how they feel post-orgasm, and I would invite anyone who's listening to this to do that now, like how do you feel moments after you climax? 
Most people will say expansive, calm, connected, blissful, dissolved into everythingness, pure. You got any? Those all sound great to me. (laughs) (laughs) You got any want to add into the soup? Uh, Complete. Complete. Yeah. Yeah. I rarely hear people say dirty, wrong, bad, shameful, nasty, gross. Mm. Like that's not that's not how you feel. That yeah. might come later once yeah. the conditioning kicks or back. Or after in. like pornography or some sort of use you have a lot of shame tied to. Sure. And like look, porn has its own frequency. You know what I mean? I'm talking about right now like pure like yeah. you and you. Yeah. Um because the thing about porn and look, again, no judgment here and I think time and place, but just like eating food. You know, if you're eating veal that is a baby calf that never got to see its mom and it was force fed and then inhumanely killed, like that is not like energetically not serving you. And so same with porn, like there can be conscious, beautiful porn where people are opting in and they are paid well and it is done in a way that is respectful to everyone involved. And there's like child trafficking that's, you know, so it's like knowing what we're ingesting and being conscious about that, I think really matters. And I will also say that if people are looking to start to cultivate like more sacred sexuality practices and starting to really get to know their their own like purity and divinity of their own creation energy, that I might recommend that they take a week or two like away from vibrators or porn just to slow things down and to get to know their own energy and their own timing. Because like if you're eating sweet tarts for dinner every night, it's hard to taste like the sweetness of an organic carrot. Yeah. So it was just, again, no judgment, but it's time and place. And if it feels in, in, enticing to want to cultivate, curate the, the profundity of this life force energy, then I might recommend like a, a teeny fast. Yeah, amazing. So then keep going into that, how our creative energy, if we're not using it to create a baby, we can harness it to create whatever the heck we want. Like whatever, if you can learn how to cultivate that energy and and aim it in a direction, you'd be so shocked at what can come in and the speed at which it can come in. Mm -hmm. And so either if you want to give an example of how you maybe manifested something in your life with your own sexual energy, maybe also the difference between uh, if you're a guy or if you're a girl, mm-hmm. you know, the difference between orgasm for a guy holding in the actual secretion or semen at, during orgasm can allow mm-hmm. you to retain that life force energy in ways that then you can put into whatever you're creating, whether it's a business, a podcast, a piece of art, music, whatever it mm-hmm. is. Um, yeah. So on the orgasm front, and I mean, you can reference the many, many biohackers out there for like the ratio of this, but I think there is like an, uh, an optimal range of, um, like ejaculation for yeah. men per month. Do, I think do you know it's it? I think it's your age times seven divided by four. I think that's great. <laughs> I don't know the answer to that, but I know that it's like less than every time you orgasm. That like the optimal amount of ejaculation is sure. less than every time you orgasm. Yeah. And that with with people who identify as male or people who ejaculate, it's like there is like this release of life force that happens. And so if the idea here with, with using that creation energy as a manifestation tool is that we want to harness and cultivate it and transmute it even. And so there is, and I am, again, I am not... Um, I'm not a Tantra expert. I am not a sex expert. What I am an expert of is transmutation of energy and manifestation and altered states of consciousness. And so there are, and thank goodness, there's plenty of amazing teachers out there. Um, But for men, it's, you don't want to necessarily ejaculate every time if you're trying to build that life force. For women, from my understanding is that it's like the more orgasms, the better, that it makes you smarter, healthier, your immune system is stronger, your skin elasticity is better, like let it rip. As long (laughs) as you're not a sex addict or that you're using it to avoid feelings or using it towards taking vital energy away from other areas of your life or time away from it, which anything can be a drug. You could kill yourself with water, Mm -hmm. right? So as long as you're not in that danger zone, then I think it's really like let her rip. Um, But then as far as the manifestation goes, I think it's pretty similar. Like I am, I actually do co-ed retreats. I do co-ed containers for what I call pleasure prayer. So using your creation energy to manifest, I call that practice pleasure prayer. Because you're basically using your pleasure to pray. And I will do that in in settings with mixed gender, all genders. And my 
my, you know, sex witch friends were like, Emily, this is edgy. This is, they're really going for it. And I don't know if I'm just like blind naivete or if, if it's just true that the soul has no gender. The soul has no gender. And when we're doing these practices, it's about you and your soul. It's about you and your dreams. And also, as we usher ourselves into higher and higher states of consciousness, we start to inhabit the duality, the masculine and feminine in, that's in all of us. Yeah. You know, like you look at most deities and there's like many that inhabit, you know, all genders. Um, and so I really, again, like I could be on this podcast in two years and be like, Phew, really blew it. <laughs> really <laughs> regretted that decision, but I don't think so. Um <laughs> But either way, regardless of your gender, the idea is that you want to you wanna place the order, right? Like, what's the magic wand? What's the dream? And you want to get into a real five senses reality of that. What does that thing look like, taste like, smell like, sound like? You want to submerge yourself into the VR headset of that dream as if it is happening now. And then you want to examine anything that's keeping you from that. Like what's, is there, do you feel like you're not enough? Do you feel tired? Are you exhausted? Like anything that's keeping you from that dream in the short term or in the longer, bigger picture. And then we want to clear the channel, right? We got to clear the channel. And sometimes that could be a good cry. Sometimes that could be a journal. Sometimes that could be raging and hitting the pillow. Sometimes it could just be a primal scream. Like sometimes we just got to like get the junk out so that, the vessel and the channel is clear. Yeah. Then we start to build this charge. We start to build this energy, which, I mean, you could do this on an energetic plane. Like if I got invited to do a TED talk tomorrow on this stuff, I likely would not have the an audience touching their who has. I likely <laughs> would not have them actually pleasuring themselves. That'd be hilarious to see you try and their reaction though. <laughs> Just like so. surprise plot twist. Like, <laughs> You're I <get> like, masturbating. <laughs> banned from the TED stage forever. <laughs> Or maybe not. Like, or they're like, revolutionary. <laughs> That's my prayer. <laughs> um, so it is possible to do this stuff on the energetic plane. It's possible to do this just with breath. I think that it's just very advanced. I think it's harder to cultivate orgasmic levels of energy in the body without touching yourself if you're a beginner. Yeah. So for most of us, like me, it's like, oh, like actually touching it, it just creates more energy. So we start to build that. We start to let that frequency build in and around the hoo-ha. And I think I did not define that term, hoo-ha. It is all genders and it's both the anatomy and the energy center around it. So male, female, transgendered, cisgendered, like it is, and it's the anatomy and the energy center around it. So when you say heart, you don't actually just mean the thing that's pumping the blood. Right. When people say heart, they mean I have a broken heart. No, your heart's still pumping blood just fine. What's happening actually is your thymus gland is shrinking and that aches when your heart is broken. Mm. Um, so we're speaking around the energy center and the organ itself. So same with hoo-ha. Um, we're talking about the anatomy and the energy center. So we start to build that pleasure, build that charge, and then we let it build all the way up into the heart. And we let that pleasure and that energy circum like circulate around the heart. And the idea here is that we're also embodying the manifestation. Because so many times we manifest from our brain, right? And we just hold the vision and we think about it. And then we accidentally stress about it. And we think about everything in between us and the dream, which just creates more stress. But in this case, we're bringing the pleasure of the dream all the way down into our body. It's like we're falling in love and making love to the dream itself. And then we let that pleasure and that energy build all the way up into the head. And at the moment of peak pleasure, at the moment of climax, then we send that energy to the dream, to the manifestation. It's almost like you're dedicating the energy to the dream. And then the really important part is that afterwards you listen, right? In that post-climactic glow where you are dancing with the divine, where you have transcended your individuality and remembered your universality, where you have placed that order, then we surrender and we allow that bliss chemistry, that oxytocin, that love chemistry to flow through our bodies and we listen. What would you have me know? What would you have me do? And usually the next step, the next person, the next call, or maybe just a new idea will drop in. So just like Shavasana is arguably the most important part of a yoga class, it's where all of the different signals that you've been sending to your brain and that your brain has been sending to your body, that's where they get to integrate. You could argue that that resting period, that listening period is the most important part of pleasure prayer as well, because that's going to be nature giving you your next assignment. So beautiful. That path of discernment, first off, to 
recognize and have the cognition that your sexual energy F harness can be used for uh, achieving whatever aim you want in life. And also just to enhance the level of vi vitality and vibrance that you carry within yourself is so beautiful. Yeah. And then also to be very clear on, on who you, who and where you share that en energy with. Mm. Uh, because in Sanskrit, there's this term Runana Bandha, which is essentially kind of like the energetic resonance that happens anytime you engage with another person or any phenomena with, around you. So if I wore your clothes, which would be a sight in and of itself, <laughs> but if <laughs> I should- wearing Andre. Are, <laughs> Who are you wearing, Andre? <laughs> <laughs> so if I wore someone else's clothes, that's one level. If we shook hands, that's another level. If we gave a hug, that's another. If we had you know intercourse, that would be uh, one of the deepest levels of that, that energetic exchange. And so if you do have the desire, which most people are listening to this, to actually bring forth what your soul is here to bring, if you're not clear on what that is because you have all these other energies interfering with that, then it's going to be very hard to have that clarity and to develop that within yourself. Mm. On the path of Tantra and like learning about the different ways that you can utilize your sexual energy to enhance your experience of life, some people, very few, choose to go down the path of Brahmachari and to cultivate that energy, to like build the energy in their spine and to, to pursue enlightenment, one might say, to know themselves at the deepest level possible, which is a beautiful path for those that feel called. And for those that feel called to be in the world and creating things and have sex and develop these relationships, what you're speaking to is so powerful because the potency of what becomes available to you on the other side of harnessing this energy is... Like you'll you'll surprise yourself in so many ways of the speed, like we spoke to, the speed of which things can come in when you place that order from the energetic resonance that you want to it to come in at and meet you at. And then you surrender and you let go and shavasana and you can see what wants to come in. And maybe it'll be in a greater level of experience than you even could imagine, which is when it gets really fun, you know, because mm -hmm. you could think what you want should come in the form of a partnership or in the form of a uh, opportunity or whatever it is. But then it comes in from left field in a completely different manifestation, but it is in alignment with the energetic resonance that you put it out, right? Mm. And so the the power of what you're speaking to in, in cultivating that energy, getting clear on what you want, which is a journey in and of itself, and then to use your energy, your sexual energy, your creation energy, your life force energy, whatever you want to call it, to then create the life of your dreams, like we spoke to you, from the inside out is a powerful invitation for the listeners to actually start to explore more. And I think conversations like you're having on your new podcast and conversations that um, more and more we're starting to see pop up as you are very much an early adopter in the space coming into talking about these things, it's going to be really cool to see the, the communities, the, the platforms and conversations that continue to spring up to empower people to discover the truth about who they are and how they can utilize their sexual energy and life force energy to know themselves, to create, and to be happy yeah. <laughs> and vibrant. Yeah, so a couple things I want to underline there. One, I think that regardless of whether or not you're monastic or uh, yeah. what we would call in India, like a householder. Yeah. Um, you Which is such like a... I don't know. It's an unsexy term. It's unsexy, uh, but, but it's like it's like less than one percent of the world's population that is monastic by nature, yeah. um, or like celibate or reclusive by nature. Mm. And I actually feel really passionately about this because, I, actually, even though well, less than one percent of the world's population is monastic by nature, most of the meditation modalities that people are doing are derivations of monastic practices, mm. and it's almost like another version of shaming sex mm. because we're like, even though it's not coming from like a Catholic church of like sex is a sin, it's like, oh well, if I act more like a monk, then I'll be closer to God, and that's not it. Yeah. If you, 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 most monks know that they're reclusive and celibate by the time they're seven. They're like, I gotta go. I gotta go to the cave. I gotta find my teacher. It's not their preference to have sex. It's not their preference to have a family. It is their preference to be reclusive and celibate. We mess it up and we deny our nature. When we deny our desires, then those desires become perverted. And the Catholic Church is a perfect example of this, right? Like those priests are not meant to be celibate. And so they are taking out their sexual urges in inappropriate places on children, right? And this has been well publicized. How many thousands of cases do we have to have, but we start to really examine this. Like, what if we gave them healthy outlets and change the doctrine and dogma around that? And so it, it applies both to sexual practices and to meditation practices. Because even if you look at like Headspace or Jay Shetty, like two of the most popular meditation brands in the world, Jay Shetty is like the only personal brand that has over a billion followers. Headspace, one of the first really early adoption meditation tools, both started by former monks. Right? So we fetishize monks because we think that they're better at meditation than we are. But it's actually just a totally different game. 
And I actually think it's why so many people think that meditation is hard because they're trying to clear their minds. They're trying to do a style that wasn't made for them. Whereas Ziva, it's, it's a derivation of something that was made for people like us, people with busy minds and busy lives. And so it actually is easier to do. And then the return on investment is higher because you're doing something that was actually designed for the brain of someone who has a job and kids. Like it's ushering you into different states of consciousness really quickly. And so I think that there's a, there's a similar game of telephone going on in both the meditation and the sexual spaces that it's ultimately not serving our highest evolution. And I would love to just clarify those conversations. Yeah. Like we have these bifurcated communication platforms now. So like, let's get the word out there on both. But back to your point of like, people are choosing that path of like transmuting that energy or using sexual energy as a path to enlightenment or are you using that energy to manifest your dreams. It's the same modality. Mm -hmm right? You're still cultivating that charge and you're still transmuting it. And then you're either sending it directly to God or you're sending it directly to the things you want to manifest on the 3D. Which is also God. Also God. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Also God. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then the other thing you said about the um, getting clear on the dreams is that one of a, a simple thing that I'd love to share about manifesting is that our job is to get really clear on the what and the why. What do you want and why do you want it? And then the when and the how, not your job, not your job. And that's hard mm -hmm. to release for a lot of people because we want to know how, we want to know when, we want it now, we want it how we want it. <laughs> yeah, but then the how limits the beauty and the magic of the manifestation because we can only really name the how based on our limited human perception of reality. And if we're really playing in the realms of magic, if we're really inviting nature to step in and help us, then like if it's, there's no point in manifesting if it's just like, I'm going to carry that pillow from that, from here to there. If you know you can do it by yourself, right. then just do it by yourself. It's right. not manifestation. It's manifestation when you start to bring in the big guns. Yeah. <laughs> Tap into uh, the energy field that is unmanifest, and then you get to actually bring it into form and be a co-creator in that space. It's like, I get the image of this like one meme I saw once of like, God, funny enough, being like a dude with a beard, but he's like holding a big teddy bear behind his back and he's taking the, like a small one away from a child. And Aww. it's just a sad thing, like taking the teddy bear away, don't do that. But if you knew what was coming, yes. what could be available to you, yeah. then you would find a little bit more comfort in the uncertainty of life. Yes. And I think trusting that your desires are divinely inspired, yeah. right? That nature actually gave you those desires because she wants to make them manifest. Mm. And yes, I'm gendering God as a woman just because it's a little provocative. It's absurd to gender this thing that cannot be named. But until it's less weird to call God her than it is to call him him, I'm going to keep doing it. Thank you, Glennon Doyle. <laughs> as you start to see the evidence, I suppose, of becoming a manifester and like actually see it work, you know, when you actually break bring things from the unmanifest into reality by virtue of using your life force energy in a harness direction and, and making it happen. And you get surprises from a connection that comes into your field or an opportunity that comes into a relationship, whatever it is. It's really beautiful. Then you start to realize how much this life is a game. And the limiter is, is you. It's like, how big can you dream? What is the biggest dream you can dream? So what is your what is the big dream that you have? Thank you so much for asking because that has been my prayer as of late. Uh, if I have just one prayer, it's like, hey, nature, like, please help me to play the biggest game that would be fun for the species and fun for me to play. Yeah. Like the biggest game. Because I don't want to play just the biggest game possible because I know I'm capable of playing a very big game. But if it's not if it's not helping people to have more magic or helping me to have more fun, then like, no thanks. Yeah. Um, so that's my prayer. So What's the big game that I am playing? When I think about how many minutes of how many days, of how many people are sp spending right now worshiping their worries. So let's just do that math for a minute. <laughs> let's just think about yesterday. We had to approximate how many minutes of how many hours yesterday did you spend worshiping your worries? And I'm not asking you because you're not a great data point, but anyone listening, <laughs> I'm like, oh, I don't know if I'm going to make rent this month. What if my boyfriend breaks up with me? There's a leak. What if it gets bigger in the roof? I don't know what's happening with the government and the bank collapsed. And like, what if there's another strain of COVID? And like the environment, and oh, climate change. And like, how many hours are we devoting our most valuable assets, which is our time and our attention to the exact thing that we do not want to manifest? When I think about that, it's like travesty. Mm. 
It's a tragedy that we are using this collective gift that we have been given of consciousness for a very precious little amount of time and that we're directing it towards the worst case scenario. And then I think about this work and the profundity of this work and the power and the potency of this work of giving people a frame to not only remember to ask themselves what they want, but then how to fuel those dreams with the most creative force that they have. When people start to shift that energy into imagining a world and a planet and a species that we would be proud to hand to future generations, like that to me starts to feel like a really big game. So the original download that came for all of this, like I was with my boyfriend and we were celebrating our one year anniversary in the sacred Qigong ground uh, in Santa Fe. And for whatever reason, we invited this woman. We were like going under this tree where we had fallen in love. And, and we invited this woman to come with us. We had just met her. And just <laughs> for some reason, it felt important that she was there. <laughs> and she put her hands on me. And when she asked for permission, she was like, may I? Mm. And I was like, yeah. And she put her hands on my knees. And she was basically like asking to read my future or energy or whatever. And and she's like, that's weird. I'm like, what? She's like, this is my dream. <laughs> what do you mean? She's like, this is my dream. She's like, but this is you. It's clearly you. But it's not just you. There's lots of other women with you in a circle. You're on a stage. It's circular. Oh, it's lights up. Whoa, it's Dallas Cowboy Stadium. <laughs> I was like, Oh, and what was weird is that I had been having that exact vision for like mm -hmm. months. I've been having this vision of the stadium with like me and a circle of women facing outward. And then like two weeks later, like the whole run of show just came through and it was like lights up Lizzo. And then, <laughs> um, and then like people dancing and like building the charge and the joy and the pleasure in their bodies and like collaborating with my dear friends, Layla and Regina and helping people to clear these blocks, to clear the channel, to place the order, to hold the vision. And then 80,000 people building this creation energy in their bodies and climaxing at the same time and holding a collective vision for the species. And for years, I couldn't stop seeing it. And I actually think that it's the bigness and the audacity of that dream that has so quickly magnetized all of these opportunities and basically like this fire hose of a makeshift PhD in sacred sexuality over the last two years and, and all these opportunities that keep arising. I think it's just like the magnetism of, of the, the, just the absurdity of that dream really. Yeah. Um, and since then, I've sort of let go of the container Right, I'm like it's not it's not about the stadium, the how and the when. It's not the how and the when. Like even the stadium, right? right? Like is a bit of how, mm -hmm. um, and the when, which I was like 11, 11, 2022, Dallas. I was very rigidly attached to the how and the when. I was like, oh right, Emily. And so now I'm I'm less attached to the container, but very clear on that it's liberation through pleasure liberation through pleasure, because I think that we're so steeped in it. It's so insidious that we don't even really realize how many ways the judgment of our own pleasure has creeped into every area of our lives. Well, I'm not going to order that because that will be, that be, might taste too good. Or I'm not going to, I can't have sex with you right now because I'm too busy. I have to make more money, right? I, I'm not going to, I'm not going to get a massage because that's, it's a waste of time. Like we just deprioritize our pleasure. And what I found is when we actually reprioritize it, everything else happens faster, easier, more fun, and more elegantly than we ever could have imagined. Hmm. So that's the game I'm playing. Like inviting people to stop worshiping their worries and start worshiping their dreams. I love that. And I'm holding that for you. And it just sounds like such a beautiful vision. We need desperately on this planet the oracles and the witches and individuals to put the lights on them and to like what what do you guys want because a lot of the patriarchal systems that have been in place have gotten us to the point where we're at which in a lot of ways is beautiful is great and there's a lot of suffering there's a lot of disconnection and a lot of healing and balance needs to come in with the feminine yeah. and so I'm I hold that vision for you and whatever the how and the when is is kind of irrelevant, but I, I hear the energy and I feel the resonance of what you're here to bring and mm -hmm. co-create. And I'm the I'm the biggest cheerleader for it. Thanks. Yeah. And one last thing I'll add to that prayer yeah. is that as we learn to listen to our bodies, as we learn to listen to our own desires and stop you know, cutting ourselves off and just only worshiping the brain and the intellect, but actually start to honor the whole thing as holy, the whole thing as divine, then I, then it is true that we start listening to the planet as well. Yeah, We start listening to what she wants, to what she needs and honoring the earth 
in in the ways because we, we can't honor the earth if we don't know how to honor our own bodies. Yeah. Right. And so so I I the hypothesis is that as we heal this relationship with our own bodies, that we will also start to heal the relationship with the planet. Mm. It's just dissolving that illusion of separateness that we hold on to so dearly. And when you're in that place where you're filled with joy, then you don't have to teach somebody how they're connected with nature. They just feel it. And from that place, they don't want to destroy it. And it's so ironic because in the West, and I think I've shared this before in the podcast, inherent in the definition of nature, if you look it up online, the definition of nature, it, it says all plant life, animal species, as opposed to humans or human creations. It doesn't include humans? No, it separates it. In the definition, it says that we are separate from nature. Whoa. Crazy. Interesting. Very. Because I definitely use nature as a synonym for universe or God. Sure. Yeah. Well, that's our definition because that's what we experience and feel. But yeah. like the definition that's in, you know, Webster Dictionary. Uh huh. <laughs> but that tells you where the mass consciousness level is at right now. Oh, that's that the... we're not a part of it. Exactly. Oh, fascinating. Very. All right. Well, let's place that order. Let's yep. update that let's definition. Let's change that definition. <laughs> <laughs> Turns out we are part of nature. And as we uh, as we hurt her, we hurt ourselves. Yeah. And as we heal her, we heal ourselves. Mm. As we heal ourselves, we heal her. Ah, uh, there's on your own journey, also like becoming a mother and having Jasper, which you shared a beautiful video of him playing. <laughs> it's so ridiculous. It's so good. Uh, I would love for you to share a little bit about the journey of how like the childlike energy has become activated in you and play and wonder and curiosity has come online more for you as by virtue of, of becoming a mother and going through that process. Mm, it's so good. It's so good. It's so good. It is the greatest joy and honor of my life is being his mom. And he, I mean, he is my greatest teacher because he's, I mean, he's honestly like legitimately smart and funny and cool. And I love hanging out with him. <laughs> Um, and I imagine even if that wasn't true, even if I wasn't like super into his personality, he would probably still be my greatest teacher because he's just changing so fast. And so anyone that goes to Burning Man, well, not anyone, but a lot of people who go to Burning Man and certainly me after my first burn, I made a video like 2013 and it was like six things the world could learn from Burning Man. And one of them was like the temporal nature of art and life. Hmm. And you get Burning Man, it's like you find art sculpture that you like, you better enjoy it because it might burn down the next day. You <laughs> find someone you're into, it's like you better connect now because you're not going to get their number or like call them later or text them later. There's no cell phones. So it's just like here, now, savor it, live here and now. And so with Jasper, it's like every day something dies and every day something new comes online. You know, every day like okay, well, he doesn't want to do, he doesn't want me to sing to him anymore. You know, I sang to him every night from the day he was born until he was like three and a half. And mm. now he's like, no, mommy, no singing. And so, and like, that's heartbreaking and mm. devastating. <laughs> but now we're reading Harry Potter. We're on chapter five of book two. He's four. I'm very proud. <laughs> um, <laughs> and so it's like the second that one thing dies, like another new gift comes online. And so it's just this, it's like samsara in real time, creation, maintenance, destruction. And because of that, it, it it requires or it is an opportunity for intense presence. I can only imagine the infinite amount of lessons and reflections that you get from a, how it allows you to unlock your own childlike wonder and, and appreciation and presence for the world. Yeah. And it's like, and I would offer to any parents, it's like, if you're a single parent or, you know, it's just, it's a lot. It's like having a whole nother more than full-time job. And mm -hmm. most of us have like dual working households. And so it's definitely a lot. And most of what kids are doing naturally are like wellness practices, right? They're taking a nap, they're playing, they're running around. So instead of being like, oh, well, I have to like be a mom for three hours and then I have to go to the gym and then I have to meditate and then I have to, it's like just do the things that they're doing. You know, when they're running around the playground, like run around the playground, like let that be your workout. Yeah. You know, when they're napping, like you meditate. When they're resting, you rest. Mm. Um, so just as much as possible, rather than seeing a, like separate or more things to do, it's like how can we infuse the things together or invite them to meditate with you, mm. right? So that we integrate versus like, I don't have time to take care of myself because I'm a parent. Can only imagine how much harder that task would be if you're not meditating. If you're not, if you don't have these practices that allow you to develop some self mastery. Oh, the other day, like, and I will, I'm proud of myself that I. This is on the first, maybe first, maybe second time in almost five years 
that I I was like really annoyed with him. Like he would not clean up his toys. And I was like, it's time to clean up your toys. It's time to clean up your toys. It's time to, like, okay, if you don't clean up your toys, I'm taking the toys away. And it was like the 10th effing time I had said it. And I was like pissed. And I had to like <laughs> go pack and I was tired. I was irritated. And then, and normally it's like a moment and it passes, but I was like mad and I like leaned into it. Yeah. <laughs> and I started like really like putting my anger on him. I mean, we're talking like four minutes. Yeah, yeah. But it wasn't his. It was my anger. It was my frustration. It was me wanting to go and pack. And I put it on him. And then like, I was like, oh, I'm like, okay. I like handled myself. But then at bedtime, we always play Rosebud Thorn. Mm. Which is like, what was the most beautiful part of your day? <laughs> what was the ouchiest part of your day? And what was the, what, what's the thing that you're working on? Which highly recommend as a practice, really with your partner or a child or yeah. anyone or yourself in your journal. We Rose do that Bud in my Thorn. men's group. And so the fact that you're doing it with your four-year-old son is absolutely beautiful. <laughs> it's so good. It's so good. Um, and and he, I asked him, I was like, you know, what was the thorn? And he was like, you were the thorn. And I was like, noted, fair, heard. And I was just, and I just straight up like apologized. And I was like, buddy, like that was not yours. Like I was feeling angry. I was feeling frustrated. And I took that out on you. And I'm really, really sorry. Mm -hmm. And I am going to I'm going to do my, I'm going to do better next time. And that's what, that's my butt. That's mm -hmm. the thing that I'm working on. And then the next day, he like told our nanny, he was like, mommy took her anger out on me. And it was okay though, because she apologized. <laughs> and so the thing I was so proud of was that, was that I, that he got it. Like the, the lesson I wanted him to get was that it's not about being perfect. Yeah. It's about repairing. Yeah. It's like when you mess up, which we're all going to, mm -hmm. that we can then repair. And I felt, I felt real proud of that. That's beautiful. That example <laughs> of like showing him by your actions that it's okay to embrace your imperfections and to like own up to it and that it's okay. Like that, is probably maybe not something that he'll, he'll even consciously remember, but it'll be ingrained in his nervous system and in his way of being in a way that allows him to have a more joyous experience with less resistance in life. So that's beautiful. Yeah, I hope so. There's so many beautiful things that we can continue to dive into in this podcast today, but I just want to open it up to you in terms of, is there anything else in your heart that you feel like you really want to share with this audience, with what you're creating? I know we can talk a little bit about your podcast, which is coming out as well. Um, but in regards to anything hmm. yeah the the podcast is coming up and maybe like relationships like mm. something around like I think it's so interesting what like my partner Adam and I have created and some of the gifts that had come on have come online from like being long distance yeah your partnership um, is so beautiful yeah way. Adam's thanks. incredible yeah, it's really special. And there's something to like the frequency with which he loves me that I think is real medicine. And like, since the moment we met, I'm like, can you please teach men how to love? Mm. Cause I've never seen anything like it. I've never seen anyone like love the way that he does. And he spent years actually cultivating the energy of his heart and like built a whole machine, like a vibroacoustic sound bed, this like opus sound bed where he's, inviting people to get into coherence with themselves and to expand the frequency of their heart. So it's not just like an accident. Like he's actually cultivated it. And then the fact that he points that at me is really such a gift. But there's something too, like he calls it like the banks of the river because it is not easy to date me. You know, I am a lot, <laughs> like a lot of directions all the time. And I just want like full freedom and, you know, I'm bossy and it's just, a, it's a, I'm a lot of a human. And so I can imagine that dating me is challenging. And yet he makes it seem effortless and joyous mm -hmm. and continues to transmute my judgment into love. And, and, and there's like the way he is like the banks of the river, I think is going to be an important model moving forward as more people start to liberate themselves. And specifically because we've historically been in this sort of patriarchal society and in a sexual container that's been predatory, right? Of like, let me see what I can get and let me oh. withhold what I can get. Like in these masculine feminine dynamics, as those start to dissolve and as people start to become more liberated, we're going to have like a new flavor of like wild divine feminine. And we're going to, my hypothesis is that we might need a new models for how do we relate with that. Mm -hmm. And so I don't have any answers really, but I just feel grateful that it's it's happening. We need more male models of what it means to hold a safe container for the feminine, for the world in general, just not prevalent at all within the leadership currently on the planet. Mm -hmm. And so in interpersonal dynamics, it's so beautiful 
when you find that divine union with a partner that you both give each other the safe ground, the banks of the river, and then also the freedom to explore the heights of your consciousness. Mm-hmm. Like the the branches height is to the same degree the roots go deep. Yeah. And then you guys get to explore so much in that space of freedom. And that becomes a big catalyst for you to learn more about yourself, to allow yourself and you together to be surprised by life and what wants to come through you. And I just know that from my own personal experience and you know from what you have shared in, in your relationship with Adam that it's uh, th- the biggest mirror, the biggest opportunities for growth and uh, the the conduit for some of the most amount of pleasure to, to flow through us. Mm-hmm. And actually that same woman, the woman who like saw the vision of the stadium, her name's Amanda Goolsby. And she under that tree did an exercise with us where she would have one of us like hold the ground, like just be the roots and just root into the energy so that the other one could energetically just fly and just see what wanted to happen in the cosmos and then we would switch Mm. and so it wasn't even masculine feminine it was like and then he would root and i would fly and that's been a really beautiful dynamic of like that idea of switching the polarities inside of the relationship is something that i i feel excited for people to start to play in because i think we get stuck in our roles and our gender roles and our polarity roles and our domestic duty roles and it's like what if we just Flip that up a little bit. Mix that up a little bit. Even I, I'm going to make a podcast on the subject of like, don't wait to get divorced to co-parent. You know, like even that, like what if you just took a weekend off and then gave your partner a weekend off before you get divorced? You know, like do that now. Um, So anyway, it's just fun to play in those, those switching dynamics. Yeah, wonderful. And now with your new show and podcast that should be out by the time this conversation's out, what uh? What are you really excited to be sharing? And not just what you're sharing, but the frequency and the way in which you're sharing, the place that it's coming from within you is really exciting. Being able to see, you know, a lot of the birthing process of it has been really beautiful because you're such an articulate expressor of the inner dimension, and then also what you're here to bring and share, and all these beautiful sto- uh, topics and story time with Emily and. Story time with- it's it's so good. So just touch on a little bit what you're excited to co you know to create and weave in that space. Yeah. So it, it's been so fun and easy and magical, and like that's when I feel like oh, like nature wants this to happen when yeah. it's just like oh, like even this week, right? We're calling it the podcast orgy week because there's <laughs> a bunch of us in town and we're all just on each other's podcasts. Yeah. Um. But even that. Blue, Leia, oh, bye. It's like all the crew is coming together and yeah. just like everyone's going on everyone's show. <laughs> it's so fun. <laughs> um. And so. Like that for me, like having a son, like I, I can't spend a lot of, I live in New York and so I fly to LA to shoot the show. So the fact that I've been able to shoot like 10 episodes in five days is such a gift. And um, even that level of magic feels awesome. And so I can feel the transmission happening even through the creation of the show itself. And also what felt important to me is that it wasn't just sitting and talking, right? Because I am so expressive. I was on Broadway for 10 years. I was singer, dancer, actress for most of my life. And so I feel excited that we're we're doing activations before every episode I bring a guest on and we basically do a mini version of this um of like the pleasure prayer, we're not touching ourselves. Maybe that'll happen later, but um, <laughs> but we're cultivating that charge, replacing the order, we're cultivating the charge, clearing the channel, and then dedicating that charge to the dream, even in three minutes. And I love that in each episode, you're gonna get to see that transmission happen, but differently for each person. Mm. And then oftentimes after the episode, we'll do a bonus where someone actually gets to share the medicine, like share the how, like yesterday we did a sound healing and guided visualization. So I led the visualization and Vailana was singing and playing bowls. Um, Aubrey Marcus did a thing where he invited people to change their future by changing their past and led people through an exercise where they actually got to like relive and rewrite a specific memory from their childhood. Um, We've had, you know, it's, it's just, there's so much richness, but the, the transmission that I want people to have, so the show is called, why isn't everyone doing this? And twice in my life, I've had that. It was, first was meditation. Second one was when I discovered the sacred sexuality work. And it just, it seems so obvious, so powerful. I'm like, why isn't everyone doing this? This is amazing. And I know that everyone's had their own version of that. And so to get to interview some of my friends, some of the world's greatest experts, and to share like, which is essentially become someone why, right? If you're going to dedicate your whole life to something, you've likely had that moment. Why isn't everyone doing this? And so to get to ask them that question and then for them to share 
it with the audience is so fun. I can't wait to see the evolution of it and what it turns into. And it feels like a really beautiful seed that you're planting. And it feels very unique in the energy of what it's bringing. So thanks. My, my prayer is that it is entertaining and enlightening. Yes. Entertaining and enlightening. It's already done. I feel that. Great. So good. You guys can check the podcast out. Link in description um, is where, as well as before we go on to my last, I guess, question for you. Is there anywhere else you want to point people or offerings that you have? And yeah. So Ziva Meditation is like the home of all my stuff. So zivameditation.com slash podcast will actually take people to a really beautiful um, masterclass in like the neuroscience behind the Ziva technique so that they can get a feel for my teaching and understand like if this thing, I mean, we talked a lot about meditation and what it can do for you. So zivameditation.com slash podcast will take people to a free masterclass so they can make an informed decision about whether or not they want to enroll in Ziva online. And then the podcast is why isn't everyone doing this? It'll be on all plat podcast platforms. And then we're all over social media at Ziva Meditation, Z-I-V-A Meditation. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. For this last question, if you could tune in to your channel, to your Oracle, and imagine that you are given a megaphone to planet Earth. You are in the ears. That's like, what, 16 billion ears <laughs> that are coming together. <laughs> a lot of ears. It's a lot of ears. And you have a message that you want to share from your soul. It can be anything. Mm. What what do you want to share with people? What reassurance do you want to give? What what message would you like to pass on? I mean, the thing I'm hearing is that bliss is your birthright. Bliss is your birthright that you deserve bliss simply because you were born. It's what you came from and it's what you will return to and that anything keeping you from that is stress. And so you have an opportunity to transmute the things that are causing suffering so that you can return to your birthright, which is 24-hour day bliss, which does not mean 24-hour day happiness. It means trusting that everything is working out exactly as it is designed and that your bliss is found right here, right now. Bless is your birthright. Thank you so much. Appreciate you coming on the show. Thank you for having me. Yeah. I'm so excited to continue to develop our friendship and, and have a party here in a couple of days. <laughs> have some fun. Introduce the yeah. play. We're doing a lot of podcasting. Now we're going to play. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Not that we haven't been playing on the podcast. I know. But <laughs> we won't one. record this one. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's LA. So there'll be like 45 different Instagram <laughs> channels going <laughs> Oh, so good. Thank you for showing up with the presence that you do, the way in which you infuse your message, that beautiful message that you just shared with the world. And uh, I really just feel the immense amount of impact that you've already had with people and teaching people how to meditate and find that bliss is their birthright and to discover that within themselves, you are a walking permission slip and invitation to a deeper reality. And so thank you for being you. Mm, thank you for being you. And thank you for the, what, no, those who know, knows, knows whatever <laughs> that one is. Like, thanks for seeing me. I see you. <laughs> yes. We're just mirrors for each other. Appreciate mm -hmm. you. And for everybody that's been tuning into this epic podcast, in my opinion, and I hope that you share that opinion as well. <laughs> Uh, like this to, sucked I watched it for two hours and I hated it <laughs> that would be impressive honestly yeah. if you watched it for two hours and didn't like it it's like what are you doing with your time <laughs> living in stress <laughs> if you enjoyed this podcast episode on Know Thyself please hit the subscribe button join us on this journey we're building an incredible family incredible community here thank you for walking the path and until next time 